From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Ignacio Ciampitti will look at the consequences of planting corn into overly wet soils, including the potential for uneven stand development and seed compaction. He'll also talk about switching to a shorter season corn hybrid if planting continues to be delayed, saying that it's too early to be considering that. Also today, K-State's Mike Stom will offer a look at the condition of the canola crop in Kansas currently, and he'll peer ahead to the major shift in weather conditions expected later this week and how that might affect canola stands. And further ahead, K-State's Charlie Lee talking this week about the decline in eastern spotted skunk populations in this region. All this and more coming up on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're glad you're tuned in for another Agriculture Today. It's been a reigning theme here this spring, the complications of getting this new corn crop in the ground around Kansas because of overabundant moisture in the soil. And so we bring by once again crop production and cropping systems specialist Ignacio Ciampitti, K-State Research and Extension, to discuss the latest on this front. And it's been a worrisome time for producers, Ignacio, whether we can actually seed this corn stand in a timely fashion. Yes, as always, thanks, Eric, for the invitation. So uh, I think that this has been the topic uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I think that many of the concerns of farmers are specifically on two aspects. I think that is one is soil temperature. Are we getting close? How close are we getting to that? And then the other one is the moisture yeah. on the extreme of having maybe overabundant. <laughs> and I would say this year planting in over wet conditions, I think that we'll start seeing more and more issues. And I think that this is a, the, the, the year that we'll see some of those farmers that they were more patient and they just go in the right time versus the opposite that is basically just getting it done. And, and I will just advise against that more because we are still on the early side of the, of the planting season. Uh, that's illustrated in this week's crop condition update from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We're behind the norm in planting in Kansas, but not that far behind, as it turns out, for the date, right? Yeah, and the, the, the pro- crop progress and condition that came out today, if you look at those numbers, I will say uh, I'm not concerned. I mean, we are Two percent on corn. I mean, equal to last year. So we are still kind of an, again at the start of the planting season. I would say that the next two weeks are the ones that basically they will give us a good picture of where we are. I would like to see specifically more the next coming week, seeing most most of the progress. And of course, that will depend specifically. I think at this point on the precipitations. And can we dry down? I mean, in terms of our soil conditions, can we get to a more normal situation of planting compared to what we have today? The other concern, start looking at forecast. I'm usually trying to emphasize to the farmers, if you look at the soil temperatures today, and if you look at the soil temperature map for our state in the last week, most of the soil temperature is between 40 degrees, and then close to 55. So we have a range of variability if you are in the northwest. So we have lower soil temperatures. If we are looking at the southeast, is the soil temperatures will reach close to 50s and 55. I usually like to make sure that we get that corn planted with really good temperature. But I always emphasize to the farmers not only to look at the temperature of the current day that they are planting, but trying to look at the forecast. And then why I'm saying that is because we have close to the end of the week a really cold front that is moving and it will put our soil temperatures potentially quite down. The water is basically reducing the impact. Insulating, if you will. Exactly. Insulating, I mean, but we are still seeing that overnight temperatures that they will be below zero in Friday or Saturday. So 
say we need to be very careful, uh, specifically with this idea of the cold drink, those seeds that they will be germinating and the really low temperature, that will be impacting basically seed conditions. Mm. Zero degrees Celsius now, 32 exactly. degrees. Exactly, zero low. degrees Celsius. I mean, right. when 32, it will be below 32 in one of the, right. I think it's on Friday or Saturday. So I think that that's one of the things that we really need to make sure that we don't rush it too soon and really to look at the next days of, I mean, in terms of outlook. What, Ignacio, generally speaking, are the consequences of planting too early ahead of these potential fall-offs in soil temperatures and otherwise? What can go wrong, if you will? Well, corn, I mean, is a crop quite susceptible to uniformity. I and mean, when you're looking at, I mean, the level of uniformity in canopy, I'm not talking about only uniformity in the, in the sense of a geometry and plants that they are equidistant. But also I'm talking about uniformity in the temporal emergence. When are those plants coming up? Are they all coming at the same time or not? And I would like to emphasize those two because they are different. From one side, I like the idea of all the plants coming quickly. I mean, I like the concept of we plant it and then those plants coming up seven, ten days after. So with this range of temperatures, the likelihood of having those plants coming in seven to ten days all at the same time is very low. And more if you look at the outlook close to the end of the week, that will be no helping. Mm. So, and the, the consequences are when you're looking at your topography in the soil, when you're looking at your soil, you have a small sections of the fields and maybe they are in different altitude and also you have different residue cover. So temperature variations, very different when you're looking at the profile. And that will be impacting the margins. And that will be impacting, I mean, those plants coming at the same time. So that's one of the factors, plants coming at the same time. The other problem is that since many of these variations in soil temperatures are very random or related to what is the position of the landscape or residue cover, most likely you will not see basically uniformity, not even on the equal distance. You might have seen plants coming 7, 10 days, and then the plant right beside coming 20 days after. That creates a problem in corn specifically. Many of the plants come in way too late. When I'm saying way too late, it could be three weeks after the initial emergence of the first plants. Those plants, they usually don't behave in the same way. They tend to finish to be dominated by the other plants that are right, right beside them. So consequences of crop uniformity basically in corn are very large, they need to be highly considered, and then we are setting the stage for potential yield. So based on this lack of uniformity, it could produce yield reductions going from 1% to, I mean, all the way to 10% or more. And everything in those situations is connected to how well the corn is planted, what was the soil temperature and moisture conditions at planting time. And add to that, if you're seeding corn in overly wet soils, there can be compaction around that seed, which then leads to emergence concerns. A lot of concerns. I mean, when you're looking at planting in extremely wet conditions, sidewall compaction or any other type of compactions, I mean, that you can imagine. <laughs> Many times you might not be able to see a consequence or immediate consequence. And you will start seeing those consequences of compaction usually a month after. When those plants were coming up, um, they probably still can come up late or later than the rest. But you start seeing that those plants, I mean, under any weather condition like a wind, they don't hold very well. And they might present problems of root stratification in the profile, basically exploring a very s small area. And then with that, the plant doesn't have a really good anchor. And then any weather condition, like I mean, I mentioned before, even B, I mean, B5 stage or before, it might probably impact in those plants and we will start seeing lodging problems, all connected to problems of planting. And then when we start looking at seed placement, we are seeing so much variability on seed placement. Seed placed very shallow or seed compacted and then roots trying to grow through that compaction, the plant trying to go through that basically layers of compaction. So that's one of our main concerns when we're looking at wet and I will say overly wet planting conditions. So, I mean, I think that we need to be very, very careful on that situation. Reasons aplenty for being patient with your plantings. And just one final thing here. If one exacts that patience and waits for better conditions to seed that corn, albeit at a date later than they intended, would they want to think at all about adjusting seeding rates in any way? 
Yeah, I mean, this year, it, it seems to be one of those years that for any farmer that is thinking, I can try to target for my maximum yield. And of course, let me clarify what maximum yield for a farmer means something different from another farmer. From a farmer in central Kansas, a maximum yield could be 160 bushels per acre. And for a farmer in northeast, it could be 300 bushels. So, so we need to adjust the expectations. And this is one of the years that you can put your expectations a little bit on the high end, uh, looking at the, the way that we are starting the growing season with the soil profile in terms of water, and looking at the prospects in terms of weather conditions for the next coming months and June. I think that could put our hopes a little bit up. So for a farmer that is working on 22,000 seeds per acre, maybe the number to be more aggressive, if you might, might be 24,000 seeds per acre. But not anything crazy, so to speak. I mean, yeah, you are adjusting your expectation based on your yield goal. And most likely, I mean, for that guy that was in, I mean, maybe in irrigation, 200 bushels, I mean, that was probably playing in 30 or 32,000, he could probably go up to 34 or 35,000. So I think that we need to be thinking about seeing rates from that standpoint. And I think that we are still yet too early to basically discuss too much about changes on high rates. I think that when we are looking at a month or a month and a half of delay, so we are entering into the mid-May or we are entering into the end of May for some of these guys planting early, we need to start looking at basically really looking at high rate possibilities because in terms of the maturity, I mean, we really need to start thinking about a shorter maturity high rate, something that we know that for sure could reach maturity black layer. Uh, without being impacted by a freeze. But we're not there yet. Well, we are not. We need to start thinking planting, but we are not yet in the moment that we are desperate to get the seed on the ground. Good input. Ignacio, many thanks. We'll welcome you back again soon. Thanks. Ignacio CM Pitti with some remarks to consider corn growers upon planting season and uh, the delays that you've experienced so far. Ignacio, as you know, is a crop production and cropping systems specialist with K-State Research and Extension. And we'll return shortly on this Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. And for you now, an update on the state of the canola crop here in Kansas. Along with us is canola breeder Mike Stom of the K-State Department of Agronomy to let us know how that fall-planted crop has been faring of late. And there are parallels here, Mike, when we talk about the status of a canola crop and the status of winter wheat, just because they do grow simultaneously, if you will. But the first question is, was there substantial winter kill at all to canola, which is a perpetual item of concern? Yeah, Eric, this year we're really fortunate that we aren't seeing that much winter kill in the canola crop. And it really starts back to last fall. We just had excellent conditions for seeding. Soil moisture was there across the state, and so it was easy for our growers to to get a fall stand. And that's really rule number one with the crop is getting it off to a good start so it can get that right amount of size that it needs to overwinter. So we talk about, you know, six to eight true leaves and 12 inches of top growth is really optimal. and, And most of the canola was able to achieve that last fall. So it was planted for the most part on time, although there were the exceptions that got seeded late. How are they faring? Now, some of the later canola certainly didn't fare as well as the canola that was planted on time. Obviously, just with smaller plants, it's more difficult for those plants to get through the winter than, than the larger plants on, on average. Uh, in a few instances, uh, we saw some of the later planted canola have excellent survivability. So I'm optimistic about some of that later planted canola. I think it's going, going to be okay. Kind of like the late planted wheat now, it seems like it's kind of come around. 
certainly some of the light planted canola has as well. The 75 degree plus days That's recently certainly haven't big, hurt. Yeah, and especially if guys were able to get out and, and finally get their top dressing done. That canola that's that's been top dressed, uh, and with the soil moisture that we have now and the warm temperatures, it's really taken off. Speaking of soil moisture, Mike, we've had excessive moisture too many parts of Kansas. Has that served as any detriment to canola's development so far? You know, looking at the crop across the state, I think it certainly has. And in some instances, I think we saw more loss from water than we actually did uh, from winter kill. You know, my overall assessment of stands is they are thinned, and it's probably likely from water, either just too much water on the field, running water across the field, or standing water. Uh, That certainly has, has cut the plant number down. But overall, I think it's still in pretty good shape. Because, in part, canola is an indeterminate crop, and it can compensate much as certain other crops can, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you have thinned your stand, you know, the stand loss doesn't necessarily equal yield loss. We think of canola a lot like a soybean and that if, you know, you have a thin stand of soybeans, soybeans can branch out and fill in that empty space. You know, canola does the very same thing. And as long as that stand loss is even across the field and is not, you know, large patches of plant loss, then it can certainly compensate for that bare area and you won't even notice it when it comes time to harvest. If all goes well from here forward, of course. Right, right. And something that was a bit of a worry, you say, through the winter and may be worrisome again because we have these coming up, fluctuating temperatures, and those extremes can be tough on canola, you say. Yeah, especially over the winter months um, when we have, you know, some weeks where temperatures are in the 40s on average, and then the following week, you know, you're down in the, the teens again. Those up and down fluctuations can cause problems in, in winter canola. You know, one of the first problems that we might see, especially this year with this freeze and thaw cycle that we like we have, you know, one of the problems we see when we have these type of cycles is uh, physical damage to the plant. And when you freeze and thaw those plants repeatedly, they'll crack open and allow fungi to come in and basically decay the inside of the plants. And, you know, that in combination with cold temperatures, you can have some some plant loss. That'll express itself fairly readily? Yeah, and especially as we get into uh, the bolting and flowering stages, which we're entering now, some of those plants that have the physical damage will look normal as they green up early spring, but as they progress towards flowering and maturity, they'll start to wilt and they'll kind of turn blue and senesce and they'll basically stop growing. But it's going to take some pretty severe crown or root damage to cause that. So if that happened, it should be expressing itself right away, is that right? Yeah, you would think, especially now that we're in this rapid growth cycle, it's going to show up and, and you're going to know that you're going to have it. And and typically this isn't like a you know, across the field problem that we see. It's it's plants here and there. Uh, but if you get a lot of plants, of course, it can be it could be an issue. But we're not overly concerned about that this year. So as you look ahead, though, and here we are in the midst of rather warm temperatures last few days around Kansas, the forecast is for quite a swing to the lower side on the temperature scale. And in fact, some uh, lows overnight later in the week that uh, may tempt freezing again. How threatening is that to the canola crop? At this point in time, I'm, I'm not too concerned about this fluctuation it looks like we're going to have here in in temperatures now that we've been up in the 60s and and 70s you know canola again since it's a an indeterminate crop it can compensate when temperatures fall and it causes flower or bud loss on the plant for instance if the canola crop was in flowering and we had a freeze come through and we've seen this in in the past in kansas fairly frequently you'll really only lose those flowers that have opened for that day and then uh, once conditions go back to normal, the canola will continue to flower, and you'll basically see a bend in the raceme. And on that raceme, there'll be a bunch of blank areas where pods or flowers should have been. So you'll lose those flowers that are open for that day that it freezes, but the canola will basically go right up along and, and continue to, to flower. So these events where it doesn't get much below freezing, the canola crop will keep right on going and you won't even really notice it you know when we get into the the mid-20s and below that's when we we start to get concerned about canola being in flowering and we have we're having these you know late spring 
freeze events. And it won't be the only crop with <laughs> vulnerability if it gets that That's low. right. So right. hopefully that will not materialize, but it'll be worth keeping an eye on. And you mentioned that top dress fertilizer application is very important to overall canola management. Hopefully in recent days with somewhat open weather, that uh, top dressing occurred. But for those who weren't able to get on their canola with a top dress nitrogen application, would it be wise to go ahead and do so at first opportunity? I think if you can get in there still, growers really should try to take advantage of getting some top dress nitrogen out there. You know, we're at the, the period in the growth cycle, bolting and early flowering, where we're at peak nitrogen demand. So the crop will basically take anything that you put out there right now. And you're not going to injure the crop significantly if you're out there uh, applying nitrogen at bolting or early flowering even. Uh, So I wouldn't hesitate if I were a grower to go out now and apply that top dress nitrogen if this is the only time that it can be done. I would probably tell producers to use a little bit of caution and not go out there with just the highest rate. You know, if you were planning to apply 100 pounds here in the spring of nitrogen, for instance, I would probably go out maybe and try 50 pounds now and then maybe even wait five days to a week and, and do another 50 pounds if possible. So you just don't so you burn, don't burn the, crop? the crop? Yeah, yeah. I think that would be wise. And that's actually a fairly common practice. If you look at other places around the world where they grow winter canola, they'll often do a split spring application. And we're actually seeing some growers in Kansas adopt that approach just to time that the need of the crop more uh, with the split. So certainly if, if you haven't been able to get across the ground, if you can now, don't hesitate to get out there and give it a try. Lastly, what else should a canola grower be alert to right now as they monitor the progress of their crop? Anything specifically? I would say probably the biggest thing now is just kind of keep an eye on the insects. This winter, it was certainly one to remember for for a lot of us. And one of the biggest benefits I've seen so far is that our insect numbers are way down in canola. Uh, We just aren't seeing, you know, the army cutworm and the diamondback moth that we were seeing um, in previous years over the winter. And we really knocked those back finally, which is is good for, for a lot of growers because you're not having to go out there in the winter and apply an insecticide. But now that temperatures have warmed and we're entering, again, this rapid period of growth, uh, we're starting to see some diamondback moth flying around in fields and they're laying eggs. And that means that they're are going to develop into larvae, and they'll be looking for something to to eat here <laughs> in the next few days. Uh, so certainly keep an eye out for insects, especially the diamondback moth. That's one that we, we are concerned about in early flowering because we will feed on the, the buds and the developing flowers. Other things to consider would be ligus bugs, false chinch bugs at this time of year, but I don't really think this is going to be a, a false chinch bug year because of the moisture that we've had. Typically, they are more of a problem when we have drought conditions in the spring. But I would certainly be scouting fields, and, you know, that becomes more and more important as, again, we are entering this bolting and flowering stage. Not exactly in the clear yet, but in some, the overall outlook for the Kansas canola crop at the moment appears favorable. I think it's in really good condition heading into the spring now. Let's just hope the next couple of months fare well for us in terms of temperatures and rainfall very well, Mike, and we will invite you back in a few weeks here, see where that canola crop is faring at that time here in Kansas. Appreciate your time right here. Thanks a lot, Eric. That from Mike Stom, canola breeder, K-State's Department of Agronomy. We'll return after this break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. 
Now today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN and the USDA posting its weekly crop progress and condition report for Kansas. And for the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture supplies in the state are at 24% surplus, 75% adequate, only 1% short to very short, while subsoil moisture supplies are at 21% surplus, 78% adequate, and again only 1% short to very short. The USDA calls the condition of the Kansas winter wheat crop 50 58% good to excellent this week, 34% fair, and 8% poor to very poor. Winter wheat now jointing at 11% across the state. And corn planting at 2%, equal to last year, and near 6% for the five-year average. As for the roundup on the winter wheat condition and corn planting progress nationally, here's the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey has relatively good news about this year's winter wheat condition. Actually saw a little bump, an uptick in condition for the week ending April 7th. Now at 60% good to excellent, up four points from last week, and double what we saw for acreage this time a year ago when just 30% of the winter wheat was rated good to excellent. On the other end of the scale, 9% very poor to poor on April 7th, unchanged from last week, far better than last year's 35% very poor to poor. The only real drought-affected state at this time is Texas. He also points to possible after-effects of what he calls a tough and brutal winter. We are watching states like Michigan and also Ohio at 26 percent, very poor to poor, unchanged from last week, as perhaps we're seeing signs that there may have been some irreversible damage done during some of those harsh cold spells in the winter without the benefit of snow cover. Meanwhile, Rippy has this year's first look at corn planting. Overall progress, nothing dramatic to report there. 2% nationally, 2% is the five-year average, 2% last year. He says the nationwide numbers are on the strength of planting in the deep south. Texas, for example, leads the nation. 53% of the intended corn acreage planted, five-year average 51%, and last year we were a bit quicker at 58%. Corn planting has progressed no further north in Kansas, Kentucky, and Missouri, each of those three states at 2% planted. In the heart of the Corn Belt, other than Missouri, we don't see any planting progress yet. Of course, that's not terribly unusual for early April, but it's going to be a while, especially with more storminess coming, before we see appreciable Midwestern planting. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Officials from the U.S. and China are continuing trade talks this week, sessions taking place via video conference. Both sides noted progress in the three days of talks last week here in the U.S., also noting there are still difficult negotiations ahead. Chinese state media said significant progress had been made during the different rounds of talks, but that a deal could not be rushed through. In a statement, White House spokesperson Sarah Sanders said that the two sides had discussed intellectual property, forced technology transfers, non-tariff barriers, agriculture, services, purchases, and enforcement. And Canada could announce a new list of retaliatory tariffs on more U.S. goods, including agricultural products, as early as next week. Those tariffs would maintain parity with the U.S. over the steel and aluminum tariffs that the Trump administration imposed upon Canada. Canada's ambassador to the U.S., David McNaughton, highlighted those tariffs yesterday as he spoke to the members of the the North American Agricultural Journalists in Washington, D.C., He said Canadian officials are reconfiguring retaliatory tariffs to keep roughly $15 billion in products from the U.S., either under a 25 percent or a 10 percent tariff. Next up, our weekly feature for you dairy producers, Milk Lines, with K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I want to talk with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning getting ready for what's coming. It's called summertime, and it comes every year here in Kansas, and it'll probably be here before we know it. So when we think about summertime, we think about our dairy farms, we need to think about heat stress and the negative impact that it has on our dairy herd every summer. So we need to get ready now. I was in uh, South Georgia 
last week, and they're already having some heat stress in their dairy herds down there. It was a nice warm afternoon. The temperature was about 75 degrees, and the respiration rates on some of the animals in the barns was above 60, which is the point at which we start noticing heat stress in dairy animals. If we're talking about lactating dairy animals and respiration rates above 60, that means that their body temperatures are probably above 102 Fahrenheit. When we get above 102 and a half, that's when we start to see early embryonic loss. So, time to get things ready here in Kansas as we look forward to the coming of summer. So, what are some things that you need to be thinking about? Well, number one, we need to get out there and get some things cleaned up. Those fans that we use to cool the cows work much more efficiently if they're clean. So, time to get out the high-pressure washers and get those cleaned up. Clean fans will deliver air much more efficiently. In fact, dirty fans generally see a decrease in airflow of about 30%. So if you don't clean them, you're losing about 30% of the volume out of every fan on the farm, which means that your effective cooling on your cows is reduced by 30%. So high time to get that on the maintenance schedule and get those cleaned up. Some other things we need to think about if you're dealing with belt-driven fans, those belts may need to be replaced and or the tensioners may need to be adjusted or replaced. Time to do those sorts of maintenance things as well. Also, if you clean your fans, they will probably run cooler, at least the motors will run cooler, so we'll have less loss of efficiency there and also less wear and tear on the motors. Need to be checking on your soaker lines and making sure that they are up and ready to go. Again, summer will get here before we know it, and we'll need those. So doing the maintenance on our soaker lines above the feed lines is very, very important that we get that done as we move through the springtime. Now, some other things to think about. Do you have effective cooling for your dry cows? How about your pre-fresh cows? These are two groups that are often neglected on our dairy farms, and it's high time that we uh, take a little time to think about how we might do a little better job as we come in to summer. So if you do not have soaker lines available over the feed lines for these uh, animals, you need to get those installed, and you need to have adequate fan cooling in those barns as well. Again, most of our dairy farms, we haven't really taken that very seriously, but we should. The losses here are fairly great as we look at animals that freshen during the summertime. So now's the time to get those supplies ordered and get the needed things installed before we get to the summertime stress here in Kansas. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to do a cooling system evaluation on their herds today. Thanks, Mike. Our weekly stint on wildlife management with K-State's Charlie Lee is next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and now our weekly segment on wildlife management. And across the way, once again, as always, is wildlife specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, a threatened species, you tell us, here in Kansas, the eastern spotted skunk, which at one time was very common, you say. Yes, it was very common in Kansas, as well as throughout the Midwestern and Southeastern United States. There was some consistent annual harvest of over 100,000 pelts in the 1930s and 40s. However, populations seem to have crashed and the species is currently listed by uh, various state agencies as endangered, threatened, or of concern across much of its range. Here in Kansas, it's listed as threatened. Uh, There's still a few known populations in the state, but very, very few in numbers. Compare it to the striped skunk, it's uh, obviously of a different appearance. Well, it is smaller than uh, the striped skunk, actually smaller than domestic cats. It has a fine, dense fur. It has a triangular uh, white nose patch. 
But the one difference is it has the broad stripe is now broken up into to white body stripes with a kind of an indefinite pattern. It doesn't have one solid stripe. It has a few vertical type stripes, but most of it is spots across the base of the back. Both probably developed that black and white coloration as a means of well, warning and it's distinguished from the striped skunk by its smaller size. It's a little bit more slender through the body, has shorter legs, smaller claws, and actually a, a finer, a softer a pelt than the, the broad striped skunk that is, seems to be very common now. Does its diet differ from the striped skunk? No, oh, it's very much the same, a very omnivorous diet. They will eat almost anything. A lot of mammals, a lot of insects are consumed. One of the things the, the spotted skunk does is it's actually much better at climbing than the striped skunk. They can actually get up into trees. Um, they tend to avoid areas that provide little cover. So they've been found in the wide open plains, but also in, in dense forest and wetland areas. But generally, they try to remain near shelter. Then that would include something that they can get under, uh, that may be brush piles, rocks, uh, buildings, and fence rows. When they were numerous, it was found that they frequented a lot of haystacks. Uh, they'd spend a lot of time in and around haystacks and outbuildings and grain storage buildings. If you have to think about what's found in those locations, it'd probably be more uh, rodents than what we would typically see on a farmstead today. So perhaps um, their decline had something to do with the change in farming practices. It's somewhat surprising to me that uh, with that type of a range-wide decline that there's not more known about eastern spotted skunks. They don't seem to be particularly a species uh, that's getting a lot of research attention. There is a recovery plan for the eastern spotted skunk here in Kansas, and I'm sure in many other states as well. But unfortunately, we just don't know enough about the decline. But when we look at the data for Kansas, some of the early records in the 1800s said that they were more frequent than striped skunks. They had a statewide distribution. And for a species that started declining there in the 30s and 40s, uh, we've speculated on the cause of that decline. And typically, the early thoughts was, you know, it was industrialized farming and those improvements in grain and haystack management. But those probably didn't occur that quickly. This is a species that largely declined within 10 to 15 years. Others have speculated that perhaps pesticides were the cause of that. Typically, the pesticides, DDT, came along towards the end of that decline, not at the beginning of that decline. Others have speculated, well, it was over-harvest. Stop the harvest, uh, the species should be able to recover. That doesn't seem to be the case either. So I think there's still a lot of things left to learn about the eastern spotted skunk, but we do know the decline is biologically real. It's not an artifact. It's not an instance of not very many trappers out there, so there's not able to survey the numbers uh, anymore. These range-wide declines uh, occurred in broad geographic areas. It's not a localized situation, so it's a situation that's probably not disease-related either. But again, it's a species that, for whatever reason, kind of gets left out. And until you come up with the money for research, we may never know the cause of the decline in the eastern spotted skunk. It's a species that still would, is worthy of being reported to the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks and Tourism if they're spotted, uh, either alive or uh, road-killed animals. would still like to know more about this species. You mentioned the recovery plan. What is that revolving around? Well, I'm sure... The most recovery plans uh, state what is known about the species, what's known about the habitat requirements, and then try to incorporate voluntary efforts at improving the habitat for that particular species. Well, we're going to need some sort of cover, uh, but again, 
the cover was ranged from the southeastern part of Kansas to the extreme uh, western part of the state. So the cover is vastly different in those two extremes across the state. So they seem to be a species that has very generalized habitat requirements. It's somewhat unique in that you have a species that appears to be on the decline on a very wide geographic range. Uh, There are species that has a fairly broad diet. We just don't see those types of generalized species go into this type of decline. So is this a predictor of perhaps extinction or an extinction risk? Again, we don't have enough data, but things do not look good for the eastern spotted skunks. Which were once abundant here in the state of Kansas, but now classified as a threatened species, the eastern spotted skunk. Charlie, we appreciate the word on this today. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And that closes out our Tuesday edition. We'll be right back here this same time tomorrow and hope you will as well. In the meantime, check out our podcast service. AgToday.net is where you start. AgToday.net. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.